Hi, my name is Gregor. I'm a PhD student in uh, chemical engineering at the Department of Chemical Engineering. And we're working with membrane processes, uh, so separation processes that can be used for every different uh, separation process and also food processing. And then we had this um, one problem and we thought uh, we have to uh, search out for collaborators and found them anyway. So now we will present you what we've done so far, I would say. So should we start with the presentation? Go ahead, go ahead, good idea. Okay, so yes, today we're gonna present you our research on um, yeah, correlative X-ray tomographic imaging of membranes for improving food processing so far away from the stomach that we just heard before. Before we start with our uh, research and our results, uh, the outline of this talk, what are actually membrane processes, um, then we give a little introduction to correlative X-ray tomographic imaging, and then we will finish with a take home message. And the presentation is split up between me and Emmanuel. Uh, so why do you actually use membrane processes for food processing? Well, there's a lot of uh, advantages that comes with membrane processes. They have um, a gentle product treatment because they can run at moderate temperatures and changes during the processing. They are highly selective and very unique uh, separation um, mechanisms. Um, they have a compact and modular design, which means that it's easy to install and also to extend. And they consume low energy and uh, compared to other separation processes such as condensers and evaporators, and is easily to integrate it with other technologies. But of course, membrane processes also have uh, downsides. So they have a short membrane life cycle and uh, it's a high cost for membranes usually. Um, the products that have to be treated uh, should be liquid or gaseous or vaporous. And the membrane performance is often limited by the temperature, pH, or the chemical resistance of the, um, the membrane material. And then they can be easily extended, but they also scale only linearly. So there's a limited economy of scale. Um, and the topic that we want to talk about today is the tendency of membranes of uh, membrane fouling, and then the need for membrane cleaning to overcome this fouling. And here on the right side, you can see a fouled membrane and a cleaned membrane. So what is actually membrane fouling? Well, this is the process resulting in loss of performance of a membrane due to the deposition of suspended or dissolved substances on its external surface at its pore opening or within its pores. So you can see that there's quite, um, yeah, quite some difference between a clean and a fouled membrane. And why are we going to talk about this? Because fouling and cleaning is costly. So uh, when the membrane is fouled and then has to be cleaned, there's production time losses uh, and then also irreversible fouling and cleaning reduces the membrane life time so that also takes time so overall the total daily plant capacity has to be increased uh, so that means it's a fine balance between uh, the cleaning frequency the production efficiency and the membrane lifetime and this of course leads to costs uh, for membrane cleaning uh, it's five to 20% of the capital expenditures of the membrane plant. So very significant uh, costs. And the membrane replacement uh, also is two to 5% of the capital expenditures. So how do we actually measure membrane fouling? Typically membrane fouling is only measured by looking at the flux if you run at constant uh, pressure. So that means at the beginning of a filtration, the membrane has a pure water flux and doesn't change. But then once we start filtration, uh, the flux declines and we have this capacity reduction. Then this can be a bit compensated by rinsing the membrane uh, and washing away loosely at attached uh, compounds. And this is then irreversible uh, reversible fouling that is removed. But then you can still see that there's still a difference between uh, the flux at the end of rinsing and at the beginning of the filtration. And this is due to irreversible fouling. So fouling that can only be removed by cleaning, if at all. The problem with this met uh, method is um, that there's no information about the fouling layer structure and no information about uh, the membrane altering due to fouling or cleaning. Uh, so for this, we uh, 
collaborated with Emmanuel and wanted to, and other people, of course, and um, wanted to look at the inner structure of a membrane. So we did this with correlative X-ray tomography, and I present you the scheme how we did it here in the following. So first, we fouled and cleaned um, membranes. Then we put them, um, we cut them in small pieces and we had a sample mounting for um, lab scale micro tomography. Then we did a face retrieval and at the end an image analysis where you can see the local thickness, for example, of the membrane sample. Then in parallel, we also did fibbing um, to uh, prepare samples, membrane samples for synchrotron uh, scans. Uh, and that's uh, nice because that would allow us a higher contrast to noise ratio, a higher resolution and a higher flux. Uh, so uh, less um, dose on the sample, which means the sample survives longer and faster imaging. However, uh, you have to write a beam time proposal and it's important to, need, uh, to motivate the need for this high resolution, uh, which is quite tedious. So in the following, Man Emmanuel will explain to you what actually is tomography and how you can use it. Uh, yes, thank you, Gregor. So, um, um, so I'm Emmanuel Larson, and as uh, Milena pointed out before, I'm um, hired at the Division of Solid Mechanics, and uh, Stephen Hall, who is also Links Director, is my boss. And um, within this, uh, and I'm also affiliated to the Lunar the Computing Center, so we we use clusters to do all the analysis at Lund University. And we have collaborated, me and Gregor and many others as well, uh, within this Vinova PhD uh, project uh, that uh, Vinova announced the first time in 2009 when it comes to increasing the capacity and skills of PhD students regarding neutron and synchrotron based methods. And um, I can also mention that uh, uh, Shun Yu, former colleague at RISE, he has given lectures uh, to Gregor and uh, on small X-ray scattering, which is actually underlying technique if you think about uh, X-ray tachography. And also Pablo Villanova Perez has also given uh, lectures in high resolution coherent imaging. And then me and Pablo, uh, sorry, me and Gregor have also worked a little bit further, both with lectures and educational to toolkits that I developed uh, uh, to let's say, make sure that uh, Gregor learned all the aspects of tomographic acquisition, image processing, image analysis, and so on. Um, and I can start with highlighting that uh, I have built this uh, uh, tomograph, which I based on a normal flashlight, which I call kitchen-based light tomography that I, um, I have at home. Uh, and this one compares very nicely to a real X-ray scanner, for example, at the Division of Solid Mechanics or even at a synchrotron neutron, sorry, <laughs> synchrotron X-ray microtomography or neutron tomography experiment. And uh, we have used this uh, setup uh, for training, uh, educating Gregor and also other PhD student postdocs. And you can see that uh, if you scan an object like this Lego man with X-rays, you can really penetrate and see the inside of the object. You cannot do that with a with a normal flashlight, of course. But the nice thing is that all the data that we acquire, they're acquired in the same manner as when you have a real experiment and also the data format, the images you have, you can treat them exactly as if you would have a real X-ray or neutron tomography experiment. And we can uh, perform reconstruction, 3D reconstruction using TomoPy. We can also carry out a lot of image processing and quantitative image analysis. And we can, based on the KBLT data set, render these nice images where you can see that the, where the local thickness varies in the sample. And um, basically by training on this KBLT setup, uh, you can actually directly transfer these skills to a real experiment that you later carry on. Um, and I will just show here a short 15 second video of how the setup works, uh, which also train, uh, Gregor uh, trained on. And um, you see here that the sample starts to rotate for each uh, rotation angle, we acquire an image, and then we will acquire a 200 projection image over 360 degrees. And at the end, we will obtain this 3D rendering of the reconstruction, and we can also perform image analysis on this uh, uh, sample to estimate the pore size and so on. Um, and further on, to give some more introduction to, let's say, X-ray and X-ray imaging techniques compared to normal light, uh, I will present something called phase contrast. 
And uh, you can think of this very easy example where we have a, a glass very close to a paper screen and we have a flashlight on the other side. If we put the paper screen further away, we will actually be more prone to detecting small, uh, let's say low absorbing differences, as in this case, this impurity is uh, on top of the glass. And uh, that is because we go from the absorption mode and we go more into the phase contrast regime. And um, in another example, which I acquired both inside our, our home and also with the help of a large flashlight outside the house, you can see that on our wall, we get this pattern of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, of this scotch. And what we basically see here is actually the phase contract effect. You can basically see all the air bubbles inside the scotch. And uh, another version of this taking a bit further uh, is that here we actually see the, the shadow of the branches in this tree. And these uh, branches are more diffuse. So my qualified guess is that we are, have actually entered more of the Fraunhofer regime. And in order to reconstruct this one nicely, we would have to do something called phase retrieval, which is, um, let's say, mandatory for Fraunhofer regime while it's optional for the phase contrast regime. And if we switch over to imaging with real x-rays, um, uh, as in the samples that we show, we have image with, uh, let's say, x-ray microtomography with a typical resolution of 0 0.7 microns. Um, and we can image both in absorption and phase contrast. And you, 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 you get more prone to detecting small uh, features with this technique. Then there are also uh, techniques such as at Nanomax, the, uh, full field X-ray holographic nanotomography, which is a lensless technique. And uh, the projection images that you acquire of the sample, you can see that they are, they, they, they are basically blurred, let's say. I mean, because, uh, and that, that depends on the distance from the sample to the detector. And in order to reconstruct this sample, you need to do this phase retrieval and you need to acquire several, uh, let's say, projection images at several sample to detector distances. Uh, typical resolution around 100 nanometers. And then there is also a technique called full field X-ray nanotomography, which, can, which uses lenses. And it can also be combi combined with uh, phase rings to have more contrast in the Selenica phase contrast regime. Uh, and this technique doesn't require phase retrieval. You, you get the high contrast directly. And then ultimately there is this uh, technique called Tycho tomography, where you actually probe. So your, 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 ex, your, your source is very small and you have to scan it over the sample and you acquire the, uh, the sax, uh, sax pattern that you then overlap, you change back to the Fourier space and eventually you can actually obtain these projection images that you then back project and you can reconstruct the 3D uh, object of the sample. And for this project, uh, we, we aim to use all of these imaging techniques to have this correlative approach on different field of use and resolutions of these membrane samples. And um, we carried out a lot of scans in, in, on the lab-based scanner. And I can also show you here really the benefit of applying this phase retrieval where you can see that you really increase the uh, uh, contrast to noise ratio. And we can clearly see the difference between different components inside the sample because they, 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 they appear as uh, taking something invisible and making it visible. And um, by applying this phase retrieval, it of course becomes much easier to segment the data, carry on uh, with the image processing, image analysis. So this is, uh, yeah, let's say work in progress. And we're also reusing some of the codes from the Kim initiative. And uh, then, um, um, uh, Torben Nilsson Pingel, who is also here today, he has also prepared, uh, I think, four or five, uh, let's say, fibbed samples that have been placed on these so-called omni pins. That is a, quite a standard way to uh, uh, put the samples on top of these pins, and then you can scan them, for example, at the CSAC beamline, at the PSI in Switzerland, or at the Nanomax. And um, I can also mention that we have applied for several beam times, but in Corona times, it was a little bit difficult to get beam time granted. But um, uh, for the CSAC beamline, we are currently on the waiting list. So we're hoping that uh, there will be brighter uh, times ahead. Uh, and with that, I will hand over again to Gregor. Yes, thank you. So back to the 
the membrane samples itself. Here you can see that we've already scanned uh, different types of membranes, here a tubular membrane and here a hollow fiber membrane, so such a small spaghetti type of membrane. And this sample was fouled with uh, bleach plant efferent uh, from a pipe mill and you can see you can nicely see the surface, uh, the non-woven -sup um, non support layer of the membrane and here the active layer. And here you can really nicely see the, the support uh, layer in the inside of, the, of this uh, hollow fiber membrane and outside the active layer. And um, now that we wanted to look at membrane fouling and cleaning, here you can see um, microfiltration membranes on the bottom that have been fouled and cleaned and ultrafiltration membranes on the top and they've been fouled with uh, thermomechanical pulping process water. And uh, what Emmanuel just explained, but face retrieved and non-face retrieved, we applied this approach here. And we nicely see that in the fouled ultrafiltration membrane, we have a bright fouling layer, so they are on top. And this is probably due to lignin adsorption. Um, so this is what I was talking about. So, but we actually wanted to tell you something about food processing. So just have a little outlook on food processing. Uh, there's um, this project that we are um, a part in, uh, rapeseed processing. Rapeseeds are nice because uh, you can push, uh, press them out and get uh, the nice rapeseed oil. And then two thirds of this uh, stays left over as a press cake. And there's a high protein content in this. But this uh, and this protein content has a high uh, has a nice um, amino acid composition, but a bitter flavor. So here, membrane processes come in uh, in the game um, to um, separate first in the microfiltration step particles and microbes, and then in the ultrafiltration step uh, to up concentrate the proteins. So we now looked at this microfiltration step. Um, from uh, the um, filter press cake filtration. And here I present you um, lab scans again from micro uh, tomography. Uh, and we've scanned two different membranes, one more open with um, 200 nanometers pore size and one more closed with 100 nanometers pore size. Again, you see the non-woven structure nicely and on the top very thick, uh, the membrane active layer. And if you zoom in, um, you can see that here on top, there's a wide line and this is probably due to fouling. Um, so we are really happy that we saw this when we zoomed in. And Emmanuel just uh, this week um, ran another experiment uh, analysis with much longer um, exposure time and also scan time. And what we can see here is for the first time that we actually see the fouling layer on top of this membrane. So this you can compare with the SAM image, but super nicely, I was very happy to see that here, um, this fouling layer line, which you can see here and here on the top, you can also see already in the 3D construction uh, rendering here at the bottom. So this really gives us a nice insight into the structure of the fouling layer and separates the fouling layer also from the active membrane layer. With this, I'm finishing this talk with my take home or our take home messages. Extratomographic imaging provides really novel insight into the impact of membrane fouling and cleaning on the membrane structure. And here you can see the scan that we've done and the, re the 3D rendering of ultrafiltration membrane. Uh, however, we need high resolution that is only available at synchrotron facilities. So this is still a challenge. And last but not least, the technique requires a wide network of experts and collaboration. This might be challenging at the beginning, but I've, I found it really fruitful because you learn so much from everybody. With this, I would like to thank everybody that was involved in this project. And here you maybe see that I'm the only one that uh, is still a mister. So tomorrow I can invite you for my PhD defense if you want to learn more about membrane fouling and cleaning. With this, I would like to thank you and finish this talk. I'm open for discussion. Thank you, Gregor. Um, I think that that was very interesting and good luck tomorrow. Thanks. Um, I, I, I don't think we have a lot of time for question, but I have uh, a, a a little bit of a pitch for you to make. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, you're talking to the converters. We know that imaging X-ray and neutron are very interesting and we should do more of it, okay? But I'm just going to ask you if, uh, you know, I, I do this all the time. I work with membranes. 
and uh, I do measure fouling and I can look at uh, chemically what the composition is on the fouling membrane. What is the added value of, uh, of what you're doing with imaging? Uh, well, it's not so easy to get out the, the, all the information that you were just describing. So it's really challenging to get an idea about the chemical composition of the fouling layer. And even when you know this, fouling can happen at very different levels on the membrane. So it can happen on top of the membrane, that's maybe the most obvious, but also membrane um, compounds can enter the pores and absorb on the pore walls. And that's the most critical and the, the biggest problem, I would say, because then they accumulate and eventually the pores are blocked. And you want to know at what time this happens and what compounds are actually entering those pores in order to optimize your cleaning procedure or running your process. So maybe you want to in, increase your shear forces on the membrane surface to take away those compounds that are, are getting there, or you want to adjust and, and clean earlier with a different, um, a different cleaning agent. So um, yeah, it's, it's a really complex topic, membrane fouling, and uh, to optimize cleaning, which is the overall goal, because we want to have a process that runs nicely, we really have to understand membrane fouling from all different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe as just a last point, uh, just 10 seconds of your time is that with the extra tomography, we can get a nice scan, let's say within 50 minutes, and it's also in 3D. And uh, I mean, if you compare it to SEM, it will require much more time and you need to, you know, cut the sample in a way. So, I mean, um, th there are so many positive aspects. I could speak about it for half an hour. That's, that's great. Yeah. I just wanted a pitch. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, if you have more questions, just con uh, contact me or Emmanuel. Yeah.